Hello everyone and welcome to our first video about the sign of four. In this video I'm going to explain a little bit about how the sign of four um, came about and about the author Arthur Conan Doyle. I'm going to explain um, about some key aspects of the two main characters that we meet in the first chapter and we are going to look in detail at the um, um, at, at those two characters. But first, we're going to, I'm going to read the chapter. Chapter one, The Science of Deduction. Sherlock Holmes took his bottle from the corner of the mantelpiece and his hypodermic syringe from its neat Morocco case. With his long, white, nervous fingers, he adjusted the delicate needle and rolled back his left shirt cuff. For some little time, his eyes rested thoughtfully upon the sinewy forearm and wrist, all dotted and scarred with innumerable puncture marks. Finally, he thrust the sharp point home, pressed down the tiny piston, and sank back into the velvet-lined armchair with a long sigh of satisfaction. Three times a day for many months, I had witnessed this performance, but custom had not reconciled my mind to it. On the contrary, from day to day I had become more irritable at the sight, and my conscience swelled nightly within me at the thought that I had lacked the courage to protest. Again and again I had registered a vow that I should deliver my soul upon the subject, but there was that in the cool, nonchalant air of my companion, which made him the last man with, which, with whom one would care to take anything approaching a liberty. His great powers, his masterly manner, and the experience which I had had of his many extraordinary qualities, all made me diffident and backward at crossing him. Yet, upon that afternoon, whether it was the bone which I had taken at my lunch, or the additional exasperation produced by the extreme deliberation of his manner, I suddenly felt that I could hold out no longer. Which is it today? I asked. Morphine or cocaine? He raised his eyes languidly from the old black letter volume which he had opened. It is cocaine, he said, a 7% solution. Would you care to try it? No, indeed, I answered brusquely. My constitution has not yet got over the Afghan campaign. I cannot afford to throw any extra strain upon it. He smiled at my vehemence. Perhaps you are right, Watson, he said. I suppose that its influence is physically a bad one. I find it, however, so transcendently stimulating and clarifying to the mind that its secondary action is a matter of small moment. But consider, I said earnestly, count the cost. Your brain may, as you say, be roused and excited, but it is a pathological and morbid process which involves increased tissue change and may at least, at last, leave a permanent weakness. You know, too, what a black reaction comes upon you. Surely the game is hardly worth the candle. Why should you, for a mere passing pleasure, risk the loss of those great powers with which you have been endowed? Remember, I speak not only as one comrade to another, but as a medical man to one who from, who, for whose constitution he is to some extent answerable. He did not seem offended. On the contrary, he put his fingertips together and leaned his elbows on the arms of his chair, like one who has a relish for conversation. My mind, he says, rebels at stagnation. Give me problems. Give me work, give me the most abstruse cryptogram or the most intricate analysis, and I am in my own proper atmosphere. I can dispense then with artificial stimulants, but I abhor the dull routine of existence. I crave for mental exaltation. That is why I have chosen my own particular profession, or rather created it, for I am the only one in the world. The only unofficial detective, I said, raising my eyebrows. The only unofficial consulting detective, he answered. I am the last and highest court of appeal in detection. 
When Gregson or Lestrade or Athelney Jones are out of their depths, which, by the way, is their normal state, the matter is laid before me. I examine the data as an expert and pronounce a specialist's opinion. I claim no credit in such cases. My name figures in no newspaper. The work itself, the pleasure of finding a field for my peculiar powers, is my highest reward. But you have yourself some experience in my methods of work in the Jefferson Hope case. Yes, indeed, said I cordially. I was never so struck by anything in my life. I even embodied it in a small brochure with the somewhat fantastic title of A Study in Scarlet. He shook his head sadly. I glanced over it, said he. Honestly, I cannot congratulate you upon it. Detection is, or ought to be, an exact science and should be treated in the same cold and unemotional manner. You have attempted to tinge it with romanticism, which produces much the same effect as if you worked a love story or an elopement into the fifth proposition of Euclid. But the romance was there, I remonstrated. I could not tamper with the facts. Some facts should be suppressed, or at least a just sense of proportion should be observed in treating them. The only point in the case which deserved mention was the curious analytical reasoning from effects to causes by which I succeeded in unravelling it. I was annoyed at this criticism of a work which had been specially designed to please him. I confess too that I was irritated by the egotism which seemed to demand that every line of my pamphlet should be devoted to his own special doings. More than once during the years that I had lived with him in Baker Street, I had observed that a small vanity underlay my companion's quiet and didactic manner. I made no remark, however, but sat nursing my wounded leg. I had a Jezile bullet through it some time before, and though it did not prevent me from walking, it ached wearily at every change of the weather. My practice has extended recently to the continent, said Holmes after a while filling up his old briar root pipe. I was consulted last week by Francois Le Villard, who, as you probably know, has come rather to the front lately in the French detective service. He has all the Celtic power of quick intuition, but he is deficient in the wide range of exact knowledge, which is essential to the higher developments of his art. The case was concerned with a will and possessed some features of interest. I was able to refer him to two parallel cases, the one at Riga in 1857 and the other at St. Louis in 1871, which have suggested to him the true solution. Here is the letter which I had this morning acknowledging my exist existence. He tossed over as he spoke a crumpled sheet of foreign notepaper. I glanced my eyes down it catching a profusion of notes of admiration with stray, magnifiques, coup de maitre and tour de force, all testifying to the ardent admiration of the Frenchman. He speaks as a pupil to his master, said I. Oh, he rates my assistance too highly, said Sherlock Holmes lightly. He has considerable gifts himself. He possesses two out of the three qualities necessary for the ideal detective. He has the power of observation and that of deduction. He is only wanting in knowledge, and that may come in time. He is now translating my small works into French. Your works? Oh, didn't you know, he cried laughing. Yes, I have been guilty of several monographs. They are all upon technical subjects. Here, for example, is one upon the distinction between the ashes of the various tobaccos. In it, I enumerate 140 forms of cigar, cigarette and pipe tobacco, with coloured plates illustrating the difference in the ash. It is a point which is continually turning up in criminal trials, and which is sometimes of supreme importance as a clue. If you can say definitely, for example, that some murder had been done by a man who was smoking an Indian lunker, it obviously narrows your field of search. To the trained eye, 
there is as much difference between the black ash of a trichinopoly and the white fluff of bird's eye as there is between a cabbage and a potato. You have an extraordinary genius for minutiae, I remarked. I appreciate their importance. Here is my monograph upon the tracing of footsteps with some remarks upon the uses of plaster of Paris as a preserver of impresses. Here too is a curious little work upon the influence of a trade upon the form of the hand, with like the types of the hands of slaters, sailors, cork cutters, compositors, weavers and diamond polishers. That is a matter of great practical interest to the scientific detective, especially in the case of unclaimed bodies or in discovering the antecedents of criminals. But I weary you with my hobby. Not at all, I answered earnestly. It is of the greatest interest to me, especially since I've had the opportunity of, of observing your practical application of it. But you spoke just now of observation and deduction. Surely the one, to some extent, implies the other. Why, hardly, he answered, leaning back luxuriously in his armchair and sending up thick blue wreaths from his pipe. For example, observation shows me that you have been to the Wigmore Street Post Office this morning, but deduction lets me know that when there you dispatched a telegram Right, I said, right on both points. I confess I don't see how you arrived at it. It was a sudden impulse upon my part, and I have mentioned it to no one. It is simplicity itself, he remarked, chuckling at my surprise. So absurdly simple that an explanation is superfluous, and yet it may serve to define the limits of observation and of deduction. Observation tells me that you have a little reddish mould adhering to your instep. Just opposite the Wigmore Street office, they have taken up the pavement and thrown up some earth, which lies in such a way that it is difficult to avoid treading in it and entering. The earth is of this peculiar reddish tint, which is found, as far as I know, nowhere else in the neighbourhood. So much is observation. The rest is deduction. How then did you deduce the telegram? Why, of course, I knew you had not written a letter since I sat opposite to you all morning. I see also in your open desk that you have a sheet of stamps and a thick bundle of postcards. What could you go into the post office for then but to send a wire? Eliminate all other factors and the one which remains must be the truth. In this case, it certainly is so, I replied after a little thought. The thing, however, is, as you say, of the simplest. Would you think me impertinent if I were to put your theories to a more severe test? On the contrary, he answered, it would prevent me from taking a second dose of cocaine. I should be delighted to look into any problem which you might submit to me. I have heard you say it is difficult for a man to have any object in daily use without leaving the impress of his individuality upon it in such a way that a trained observer might read it. Now, I have here a watch which has recently come into my possession. Would you have the kindness to let me have an opinion upon the character or habits of its late owner? I handed him over the watch with some slight feeling of amusement in my heart for the test was, as I thought, an impossible one, and I attended it as a lesson against the somewhat dogmatic tone which he occasionally assumed. He balanced the watch in his hand, gazed hard at the dial, opened the back and examined the works, first with his naked eyes and then with a powerful convex lens. I could hardly keep from smiling at his crestfallen face when he finally snapped the case to and handed it back. There are hardly any data, he remarked. The watch has been recently cleaned, which robs me of my most suggestive facts. You are right, I answered. It was cleaned before being sent to me. In my heart, I accused my companion of putting forward a most lame and impotent excuse to cover his failure. What data could he expect from an uncleaned watch? 
Though unsatisfactory, my research has not been entirely barren, he observed, staring up at the ceiling with dreamy, lacklustre eyes. Subject to your correction, I should judge that the watch belonged to your elder brother, who inherited it from your father. That you gather, no doubt, from the H.W. upon the back. Quite so. The W suggests your own name. The date of the watch is nearly 50 years back, and the initials are as old as the watch, so it was made for the last generation. Jewellery usually descends to the eldest son, and he is most likely to have had the same name as your father. Your father has, if I remember right, been dead many years. It has therefore been in the hands of your eldest brother. Right so far, I said. Anything else? He was a man of untidy habits, very untidy and careless. He was left with good prospects, but he threw away his chances, lived for some time in poverty, with occasional short intervals of prosperity, and finally, taking to drink, he died. That is all I can gather. I sprang from my chair and limped impatiently about the room with considerable bitterness in my heart. This is unworthy of you, Holmes, I said. I could not have believed that you would have descended to this. You have made inquiries into the history of my unhappy brother, and now you pretend to deduce this knowledge in some fanciful way. You cannot expect me to believe that you have read all this from his old watch. It is unkind and to speak plainly, has a touch of charlatanism in it. My dear doctor, said he kindly, pray accept my apologies. Viewing the matter is an abstract problem. I had forgotten how personal and painful such a thing might be to you. I assure you, however, that I never even knew you had a brother until you handed me the watch. Then how in the name of all that is wonderful did you get these facts? They are absolutely correct in every particular. Ah, that is good luck. I could only say what was the balance of probability. I did not at all expect to be so accurate. But it was not mere guesswork. No, no, I never guess. It is a shocking habit, destructive to the logical faculty. What seems strange to you, is only so because you do not follow my train of thought or observe the small facts on which large inferences may depend. For example, I began by stating that your brother was careless. When you observe the lower part of that watch case, you notice that it is not only dinted in two places, but it is cut and marked all over from the habit of keeping other hard objects such as coins or keys in the same pocket. Surely it is no great feat to assume that a man who treats a fifty-guinea watch so cavalierly must be a careless man. Neither is it a very far-fetched inference that a man who inherits one article of such value is pretty well provided for in other respects. I nodded to show that I had followed his reasoning. It is very customary for pawnbrokers in England when they take a watch to scratch the numbers of the ticket with a pinpoint upon the inside of the case. It is more handy than a label, as there is no risk of the number being lost or transposed. There are no less than four such numbers visible to my lens on the inside of this case. Inference that your brother was often at low water. Secondary inference that he had occasional bursts of prosperity, or he could not have redeemed the pledge. Finally, I ask you to look at the inner plate, which contains the keyhole. Look at the thousands of scratches all round the hole, marks where the key has slipped. What sober man's key could have scored those grooves? But you will never see a drunkard's watch, wa drunkard's watch without them. He winds it at night and he leaves these traces of his unsteady hand. Where is the mystery in all this? It is as clear as daylight, I answered. I regret the injustice which I did you. I should have had more faith in your marvellous faculty. May I ask whether you have had any professional inquiry on foot at present? None. 
hence the cocaine. I cannot live without brain work. What else is there to live for? Stand at the window here. Was ever such a dreary, dismal, unprofitable world? See how the yellow fog swirls down the street and drifts across the dun-coloured houses. What could be more hopelessly prosaic and material? What is the use of having powers, Doctor, when one has no field upon which to exert them? Crime is commonplace, existence is commonplace, and no qualities save those which are commonplace have any function upon earth. I'd open my mouth to reply to this tirade when, with a crisp knock, our landlady entered bearing a card upon the brass salver. A young lady for you, sir, she said, addressing my companion. Miss Mary Morstan, he read. Hmm, I have no recollection of the name. Ask the young lady to step up, Mrs Hudson. Don't go, doctor. I should prefer that you remain. End of chapter one. Okay, so before we start to discuss chapter one and the characters of Holmes and Watson, we need to look at a little bit of background and context about the novel. The Sign of Four was published in 1890 and its author, author Arthur Conan Doyle, was a Scottish doctor. And The Sign of Four has, has really good local connections because um, although Arthur Conan Doyle was Scottish, he was working as a doctor in Portsmouth when the novel was written. Um, the Sign of Four is a second book about Sherlock Holmes. And in the chapter, you'll have heard the title of the first book, A Study of Scarlet, sorry, A Study in Scarlet, which um, became uh, very popular um, when it was published the year before. And um, Watson, um, is the narrator in all of the Sherlock Holmes novels. So in the chapter, you hear him mentioning about how he's written it. Um, detective novels were really taking off at this point. And one of the reasons was because of the um, way that the British public and particularly the middle classes um, felt about the police. They felt that the police were incompetent, didn't know how to investigate crimes properly. And, um, one of the um, big stories at the time um, was Jack the Ripper, um, who murdered five women the year before in London um, and who was never caught. And the public um, considered um, the police very, very ineffective in their efforts to catch Jack the Ripper. There was a lot of newspaper um, articles complaining about them. And so um, the public then um, really took to the character of Holmes, who, as you can see from the first chapter, was this very scientific t detective um, who could guarantee that he was always going to be able to solve a problem by, um, by logic and reasoning. Um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle himself uh, was born in Edinburgh in 1859 um, and his father was an alcoholic so he grew up in, in a, a very poor um, uh, background but he had rich uncles um, and um, they helped him attend school and medical school and and uh, there he came across this guy called Dr. Joseph Bell, who um, a lot of people think the character of Sherlock Holmes is partly based on because Dr. Bell um, was um, uh, brilliant at looking at a patient and observing them really closely and then making deductions about them based on what he'd observed. And so in chapter one um, of The Sign of Four, uh, when um, Holmes takes the watch um, from um, Watson and observes um, all of these little signs and then comes up with an analysis of the character of Watson's brother, um, that is all based on the sort of things that Dr. Bell used to do, which um, Doyle was very impressed with. We'd also guess maybe that the um, the fact that his father was an alcoholic gave him some of the knowledge about alcoholics that he also um, showed in that chapter. 
Um, Doyle um, didn't really want to be known just for writing the Sherlock Holmes stories. He considered them like um, fun and not very serious. Um, and it was his serious historical writing um, that he wanted to be remembered for. But um, I don't think anyone even reads his, his historical books these days. Um, and Holmes um, has become the character um, by which everybody remembers him because um, um, he's such a unique and interesting detective. Okay, so in chapter one, um, we are introduced to the um, to Holmes and Watson, and they share a flat together at 221B Baker Street, where they are looked after by their housekeeper, Mrs. Hudson, who appears at the end of the chapter, as you noticed, to introduce um, Mary Morstan, who's going to be the focus of chapter two. Um, so some of the things you'll have noticed in that chapter um, is that Watson is an army doctor um, who was wounded in the leg in Afghanistan. Um, so a lot of people think that what of Watson is a bit of a um, a bit of a wimp compared to his friend Holmes, but in actual fact he's not at all. He's um, um, he's deliberately established there as somebody. Um, who's actually seen active service, um, who's um, suffering from a war wound that kind of holds him up, but it shows his bravery um, and the fact that he's, um, he's accustomed to uh, getting into difficult situations. Um, Watson's a very straightforward, honest person. And although he admires Holmes very much, he totally disapproves of his drug-taking lifestyle um, and the two characters are created to be in that contrast to one another. Um, that one of the big themes in this book is um, what we call emotion versus rationality. Um, and we have Holmes representing the rational scientific side of people and Watson representing the more emotional side. And we'll see in chapter two. Um, how that emotional side is going to develop in the book. Um, he cares about um, Holmes a lot and he's concerned about his drug taking. Um, one of the things you probably want to know in terms of context is that at this point, cocaine and morphine, which Holmes injects, were not illegal drugs. Uh, so Holmes isn't doing anything illegal by taking these drugs, but he is, however, as Watson points out, um, doing something that is very detrimental to his health because um, even though um, cocaine um, was available for purchase from the chemists, it was not considered, you know, a healthy or a safe thing to be doing. Um, um, but Holmes um, gets very, very bored and restless when he's um, not engaged on a, an interesting case and he uses drugs to relieve his boredom. So let's look at the first key um, section from that chapter in a bit more detail. And that is the very first uh, two paragraphs of the book. We're introduced to Sherlock um, and the uh, point of view is first person because the whole book is narrated by Watson. So we are immediately shown that Sherlock is the focus of the book um, and that Watson is um, the kind of the his sidekick, his wingman, but not, um, not going to be the central character of the book. Um, and we are introduced to him in the act of injecting himself with a 7% solution of cocaine. And this is described in minute detail. Um, so we can imagine the two characters sitting there in their living room um, and Sherlock Holmes is um, uh, described as picking up the um, hypodermic syringe uh, with his long, white, nervous fingers. So. Um, nervous might imply that perhaps his fingers are trembling a little bit um, and so they immediately show um, 
that he is in a state of um, of, of some uh, irritation or upset. Um, for some little time, it says, um, his eyes rested upon the sinewy forearm and wrist, all dotted and scarred with innumerable puncture marks. So he's thinking about the, the, the many, many times that he has already injected himself with cocaine. So this tells us that this is not a new habit, that this is something that he, um, um, that, that, that he does on a regular basis. Um, and he does this three times a day for many months. So Watson's describing this in detail and describing how upset he's been getting by the sight of his friend's self-destructive tendencies. Um, and finally, he's going to um, break down and try to get Holmes to see reason, but he's, um, he's worried about it. His great powers, his masterly manner, and the experience which I'd had of his many extraordinary qualities all made me diffident and backward in crossing him. So we've got this guy here. He's a medical doctor, so he's got the knowledge to um, um, speak to Holmes on on a um, on, on the basis of his health. Um, he's an army officer, so he's um, he's got been in the habit of commanding troops and so on. So this isn't some timid little man. And yet Holmes is presented to us as being so almost like superhuman that it makes um, Watson worry about crossing him. So um, let's look at this uh, next bit of the conversation now, um, where Watson has taken the plunge and he's decided um, that he's going to try to make Holmes see sense about his drug taking. Um, he says, why should you, for a mere passing pleasure, risk the loss of those great powers with which you have been endowed? So he's saying, basically, um, that you, you, your drug taking is eventually going to destroy your, your intellectual abilities and your great detective um, abilities. Um, and you would think that somebody of Holmes's intelligence would be able to recognize that. But Holmes is saying, you know, that, that he can't, um, he can't give up the drugs because work is a drug for him. And when he's not fully involved in some work that engages him, then drugs are the only thing that go that's going to help him. Give me problems, give me work. Give me the most abstruse cryptogram or the most intricate analysis and I am in my own proper atmosphere. He says, I crave for mental exaltation. So in other words, he gets the same high from his work that he does from drugs. And um, we get the impression here that Holmes is not exactly a modest character um, because he's also saying that he's the only person in the world that can do the kind of work that he does. He's the only unofficial consulting detective in the world. So Holmes has a high opinion of his own um, abilities. And um, he, he's making it clear to the reader that he's only going to take on cases that really provide him with this intellectual challenge. So in, that first in, in this first chapter, we are being, um, being prompted to look forward to this adventure. It's going to be really, really special and interesting and difficult because otherwise Holmes would not be take would not be taking it on. So we've thoroughly involved the reader here in in wondering what kind of case is Holmes going to be tackling here that is going to be um, of such um, interest and challenge. Okay, so the next section we're going to look at here um, is where Holmes explains to Watson what he's learned about Watson's older brother from, um, from examining the watch. Um, and, um, of course, he's done this terrific job of looking at, observing the various um, 
tiny little signs, the scratches, the numbers left on the watch, um, and using those to deduce um, some um, very accurate facts about Watson's brother to the extent that Watson uh, believes that he can't possibly have done this without knowing something about his brother in advance. Um, but, however, um, it does show us something important about uh, the, the difference between Holmes and Watson and the way the author is contrasting them um, to um, help um, develop this theme of emotion versus rationality. Because in all of this uh, excellent deductions uh, that Holmes has made, he's forgotten about the emotional impact that what he says is going to have on Watson. Um, and of course, Watson is very upset um, because he thinks that Holmes is, um, is basically trying to, to trick him um, and um, and he finds it quite hurtful that he's used his brother's sad life story to do that. Um, and so here we get this um, Holmes um, realizing that he hasn't, you know, that, that he hasn't taken the emotional aspect into account. Pray accept my apologies. I had forgotten how personal and painful a thing it might be to you. Um, so he's explaining that he works on pure logic um, and he never makes guesses. And this is something very, very important that we need to know about Holmes as we, as we go through the book. So finally, we're just going to look at the very end of the chapter where, um, um, where Mary Morstan is announced and the reader is um, alerted to the fact that Holmes's new adventure is about to begin. Uh, originally, this this book was uh, published in serialized in a magazine, as a lot of nineteenth century books were. So each chapter had to end with a bit of a hook um, to make sure um, that uh, the reader would want to buy next week's instalment. Uh, so in this case. Um, um, we are left with the question of who is Miss Mary Morstan um, and how is she going to present Holmes with an adventure worthy of his very high standards. I cannot live without brain work, he says. Um, and he doesn't mean that he's prepared to just take on any old case. He says crime is commonplace. He doesn't want to um, just investigate ordinary crimes he wants his powers his great talents to be put to use upon something interesting one of the other things to notice in this last couple of paragraphs in chapter one is the motif of fog um which um uh runs through the book. Fog um, was a big characteristic of London in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, because of the pollution and the smog there, which turned any fog into a nasty, thick, yellow... Um, they call them pea supers because they, um, the, they were fogs that you could almost touch like um, as if you were being enveloped in, in, in a big bowl of yellow soup. Um, and so the fog is emblematic of London uh, because uh, people associated London with, with the fog. Um, that's actually where the, um, the phrase, the big smoke from London comes from as well. And, um, but it's also uh, a, a use of pathetic fallacy here because this fog is reflecting almost the um, the confusion and disorientation um, that Watson feels as he tries to follow Holmes through this mystery and that the reader feels as well. Holmes is the only person who can, um, uh, who can find his way through the fog um, and come to the solution of the mystery. So the fog is, is an example of pathetic fallacy that pops up again and again in the book. So you want to keep an eye out for it. Okay, so the purpose of chapter one really is to, um, to get 
an overall sense of what the two main characters are like. Um, so we learn that Holmes is a very dominant person. He's intelligent, he's focused, he's easily bored. And his extraordinary powers of observation and detection make him an exceptionally talented detective. Watson, we learn, is the, uh, the sidekick to Holmes. And the literary term for this um, is a foil. When we, when we hear of a character in a book being described as a foil, that means that they're there to kind of show off the main character. So in this case, Watson is used to show off superior um, Holmes's superior talents. And um, Doyle uses him as the narrator um, to do this and to keep the, so as a reader, we're kind of put in the position of Watson. We only know what Watson knows. And as we go through the book, Holmes kind of teases him and lets him in on a little bit of the facts, but not all of them, so that we as readers are kept intrigued. Uh, if the novel was narrated from Holmes's point of view, it would not have that kind of, um, uh, that, that kind of um, interest for the reader because uh, we would already know Holmes's way of thinking. So the use of Watson as narrator is a very effective device to keep the reader involved and guessing as we go through the novel. Okay, that's the end of our um, chat on chapter one. Um, next time we will go on and do chapter two.